welcome to a very special episode of Think Fast and Advertising is Dead. We're doing a bit of a crossover. We haven't done a crossover and it was about time. It almost close to what? A year since we started Think Fast or have we crossed a year? I don't know. Sujita, has it been a year? We're getting we still close have not to met. it. I think uh, our first episode was sometime in November. We have Just for clarity still, guys, oh my God, we have both like Arjun, never no? met. Even pre-Think Fast, till date. We were supposed to meet in real life the day my son was born. Because my son was supposed to be born a couple of days later. But he decided to say, no, no meeting yet. Wait for it. So, um, hence, we have not met yet. But eventually, we shall. Soon enough. um, Because I'm going to be in the Delhi. Dude, you should I was in Delhi on Wednesday. But I had a morning evening. So, I didn't like What a little piece of shit, Varun. I would have come in like... I was in a studio doing a shoot. I had makeup on. I would do that. Like, I was like, dolled up for this whole like vibe that was going on oh my god even more yes. lovely, so to all AID lovely. listeners this is obviously a different vibe but if you haven't started listening to Think Fast it's about time that you subscribe to Think Fast because what we drill into is a lot of while we talk about the deeper stuff on advertising is that Think Fast is, is giving you a weekly update on all things business startups and media which both of us do so without this episode as we go beyond the initial stories of the week we're going to have this Interesting scenario where we have not technically introduced ourselves and what our backgrounds are to our audience in one year. So we thought, oh, we missed this. So let's do that by me asking Suchita questions and then she will ask me questions about our individual journeys and why we ended up here on a Saturday recording this podcast. And for all Think Fast listeners, you get to know a little bit more of us and more Yas Queens happening here. But beyond this slightly more sober start to an episode, which is not necessarily what happens on Think Fast, what has happened this week? What is happening? So That's much true. and nothing at all. Let us first start with Mr. Elon Musk has uh, bought Twitter slash is uh, in the general direction of purchasing Twitter at the original price. The past four months were a total waste <laughs> of everyone's collective time. What did you think of this like dilly dallying? He obviously got his ass kicked by the general judicial system. of. So I was actually USA. listening to Pivot. Interesting the podcast, which was the frame of mm. reference for our podcast. And they were talking about this. And they said that what would have happened this week is what normally before these kind of, you know, cases kind of go to court, you have these mock trials that you set up where you actually put him through that basis. I feel that they did, a, they felt that maybe they did a few of those mock ones, knew this is going to go <laughs> totally sideways and decided, let's just not even put ourselves through that. Let's go ahead with the deal. Is what Scott Galloway and Kara Swisher yeah. felt. But... I feel it's a, at the end of the day, you don't want Elon Musk to own Twitter. You don't want him to waste his time doing this. You want him to make humanoid robots. You want him to take us to Mars. You want us to, want him to like take the whole, you know, battery revolution, the EV revolution ahead. As someone who's seen the work and tried to ignore to whatever extent I can, the nonsense of Elon Musk, I would rather he focus on the Mm -hmm. work, which he can really give the world. Twitter feels like a random like thing he wants to do while he's taking a dump in the morning. Distraction. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. I, I think he definitely seems like the kind it's of man who can multitask. It's and it's just one of those, like, the man can have, like, 10 kids with, like, six different women. <laughs> I'm sure he can figure out a way to, you know, like, run these multiple different companies, hire the right people to, you know, front end uh, a lot of things. I don't know. I, I think the conflict that I have with this is, If your general sort of underlying thesis is that, you know, media needs to be more independently Mm. operated, uh, having someone who's a bit of like a, you know, psychophant, almost like Elon Musk at the helm of this is a little scary. What I'm interested in seeing is, you know, what is the leadership Mm. that he puts into place, right? So uh, now God knows if, uh, you know, Mr. Parag Agarwal will uh, continue at Twitter or not, seems unlikely. But it'd be interesting to see the leadership that he puts into place. And, you know, to be honest, like now is Twitter worth 44 billion, you know, $54 a share, is it not? That time will tell. Their revenues definitely don't um, reflect that anywhere at all. But I do think, I don't know, like there's a part of me that's yeah. rooting for Twitter because Twitter has done what is very difficult to do. And I know we're going to talk about this with respect to another company later on in, in the episode, but Twitter has really become like, you know, the sort of nucleus of all like tech, journalistic, startup, political, it is the sort of like content, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of like 
power associated with it and there's a lot of you know fairly interesting ways of like monetization that could potentially be associated with it so i think as a as a consumer tech and a media tech junkie i'd love to see this platform be able mm. to deliver more in terms of revenue and monetization yeah. and you never know man maybe musky musk can uh, you know put some muscle there was uh, also uh, interesting thing i saw machine. mkbhd the og tech youtuber got access to the edit button on twitter they're testing out and so he made a small youtube short showing that it's yes. actually i actually like the way it's been structured so you can actually see all the past versions it's not like mm-hmm. it's only like deleted and nobody can see what you tweeted last so even when you retweet it it actually has the things to see past versions you do an arrow button down and you see all past so yeah. basically he made two typos after he was he made a typo on purpose so he could correct it and while doing that he made a second typo by mistake and so that actually shows quite clearly so yeah. i like the ui design yeah. this could actually be the best way to do it mm. it takes away that one big issue that you know you, i have with typos because i do that typo tweet and i'm like oh my god i have to rep this entire thread out here again so i yeah. i feel i mean twitter seems yeah. to be on an interesting yeah. track right now yeah but isn't it like tragic that the most discussed feature you it's know 15 button. years later is still a goddamn edit button yeah. you know what i mean like we are supposed to be on mars at this which point which is why i'm like he should not be on twitter button, uh, he but... should be focusing on that stuff but speaking of mars considering yeah. indian roads are like right, driving on mars and some of those are on or <laughs> some of those are Great on segue. autos vataj some of those are on Large autos uh, do you read the news about <laughs> ola uber and rapido they've been told that their auto services are illegal in in bengaluru this is whole like auto drivers union is going to launch the namma yatri app Like just basically R yeah three for those who don't get what Nama means. But what do you think of this? And also, there's been a bit of background to this, right? Is that they were supposedly doing a minimum, and Angela Smith told us this uh, before we start recording that they were charging a minimum for hundred, even if the fare was about I think forty fifty rupees as well, putting some service charge etc on it. And a bunch of people pointed that out, and that's where the whole thing kind of spiraled from. But this is not new for someone like Uber. Yep. Yeah. Or Ola. I mean, they've gotten into issues with all types of unions multiple times in the past, and you know, like you were saying, it's not like an India thing, right? Yeah. It's happened globally as well. Uh, so I don't know. I think this is like a bit of a meh. As per me, yeah, I I didn't really care about the story much. I I think the question that I'm interested in is I wonder how much autos contribute to their business. I can't imagine it being a uh, significant, you know, either in terms of like revenue or you know gross bookings or any of that. Yeah. Definitely not margin, given that autos are typically used for short distances, right? And the use case slash the real money maker in businesses like Ola and Uber is your longer distances, because that's where the margins, you know, gross bookings, etc. triple up considerably so i don't know the numbers are over here but, yeah. but the, the is article like doesn't say what a, a percentage it is and also if you look at the number it's quite low right like, because they were charging a minimum of 100 versus the minimum fare is basically 30 rupees for first 2 kilometers on the actual meter so i gather where the issue came from but uh, the this whole minimum fare thing has been around for a while so i agree it's not like the biggest news over there in big news actually process backed out from a deal that would have made pay you This massive, this like is this is a done deal man. from what I assumed it was, but suddenly this just went sideways. Yeah. Do you not remember me showing off about how right I have been yes. about my fintech aggregation prediction in December of last year, uh, and this particular acquisition would have been uh, you know, huge because again the value of the deal was yeah technicality is one. Also, like mm. dude, markets are like choppy. AF, you know, everyone is like freezing hires, cutting teams left, right, and center. Uh, this is like uh, you know joke online, right? Which is um, the new quiet quitting yeah. is quiet firing because organizations, especially these larger ones that have you know more like reputational risks um, uh, at stake, are slowly letting go of people. I'm digressing, but point being that it's not unbelievable because your markets are just not supporting. a 4.7 billion dollar yeah. deal what i find a little strange is i don't know usually in scenarios like this people use you know quote, quote unquote choppy markets as mm. a way to like lowball i think what's interesting about this is like there was no like it's it seems like there was almost no like negotiation on the table it was you know whoops sorry not yeah. happening anymore and i mean it's it's really yeah. difficult to pull your mind out of a acquisition mindset especially for a founder so yeah. i i can't imagine any of this being easy for them or their teams yeah also because you go through a certain process right if you if you're at this stage where you're almost we've gone through the process you almost i i i would gather they already would have kind of been embedded together in in many ways 
gets tricky but again this is what markets do right sometimes the timing is all that matters uh, and sometimes you just got kind of move ahead but i, I, yeah. I don't think pay you in the long run because pay you is a solid company i i think that yeah. the good part for them is they're not one of those who can't not do this without the acquisition but i would have just kind of set them up for a much bigger playground in that sense of the word yeah. what else is happening what else is happening Honey Singh and Milingaba dropped a new song Paris Ki Trip. Jalasmi is trying oh to like f- with us this week. Have you heard Paris Ki Trip, Sujita? Do I look like I have heard? Actually, I do look like You look like you can heard by <laughs> Paris Ki Trip. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after the amazing remix that I played as a prelude to this uh, recording, which ladies and gents, I will share the link of the song uh, as a part of my recommendations. That's a no, recommendation actually this song. week. Dude, what a great song. Uh, but listeners, we'll get to it all the way at the end. So tell me more about Paris Ki Trip by Yo-Yo Honey Singh. I have no idea. Basically, every Honey Singh song since his return has been the same. Which is basically, uh, why is this a song? But uh, with that sound effect. But uh, yes, I have no idea why this is a story. Jealous me trying to just like pull a fast one on us. But what does this happen? What does this happen? Ray so Dalio uh, is exiting yes. from Bridgewater. My God, oh. uh, I mean, actually, Legend. this is not like a my God thing because man was getting old. But I, I just think he's done it really well. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it's like the opportune time, you know, succession plans been sort of laid out. And I think the thing yeah. that I found interesting about this is uh, he's taken away a lot of like the rights that say, for example, like a chairman, you know, or a managing mm-hmm. director or someone in a slightly more like loftier position would have. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, for example, uh, he's given up his co-CIO role along with his voting rights. Which I think is good to do because otherwise what ends up, I mean, humans are humans, right? You always have this yeah. like nagging thing of interfering. So it seems like he's taking a very nice clean break from running Bridgewater. But what a freaking empire this man has built. And to think yeah. that he's come from absolutely nothing at all. For those yeah. of you who haven't read his book, Principles, you should it's pick it up and check book. it out. I was just going to ask you, what do you think of the book? I find it super interesting. Don't agree with everything, but it's super interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's a little prescriptive. So mm. it's a little like, you know, this is right, this is wrong. And also, I think it's it's very like idealistic. So for example, mm. this whole fundamentally, I love the idea of, you know, feedback loops and creating frequent enough feedback loops for people you work with. But I think it takes a type of person, a type of temperament to, you know what I mean? To take that yeah. much feedback and actually do something about it. Whatever, I can go on and on <laughs> talking about his book and, you know, but good book, good read nonetheless. There is another thing which you wanted, which I, actually you pointed out, and and I've been looking at this brand for a while, which is Liquid Death. Yes, this is a super interesting brand, right? I mean, there's a they're a water startup valued at seven hundred million dollars. I noticed it because I saw a lot of YouTubers who I follow internationally who always have like a Liquid Death can, and I was always intrigued to know what is in that. What are they drinking? Yep. Such a great story. Yeah, I think great story, and also like great. Timing, I would say. Uh, I think mm. they really nailed their timing because, you know, we're kind of at like the peak of all things woke, right? And they sort of, you know, double down on that say no to single use plastic and uh, obviously like aluminum cans, though uh, they do have a larger carbon footprint in their manufacturing. They recycle much easier and much faster than, you know, plastic. So I, I think there were a lot of, you know, good things uh, happening at the right time. Uh, another really interesting insight, which I read on this newsletter that I subscribed to call Banana Capital is that one of the key drivers of liquid death success, obviously hindsight is twenty twenty, but one of the key drivers seems to be that it looks like alcohol. So I don't know if you've mm. seen like the can of White Claw and all these other seltzers like hard seltzers that have come up in the US, but liquid death literally looks like one of those, you know, seltzer yeah. cans. So it feels like alcohol. You you know, you feel like you're doing something risky, but it's actually just Pani. Yeah. yeah, but that and lots of sales in music there. festivals is what I remember reading about a while back. And great partnerships too. They partnered with Wiz Khalifa as a part of his uh, tour and uh, Wiz Khalifa's tour bus had like this giant liquid death, uh, you know, sticker on it. So yeah, good, good timing, virality, partnerships. I was talking to a, a founder a while back and I know we need to go for a break, but and especially from an Indian context, I said, okay, one second, while you're internationally talking about all these, everything from, let's say, tin cans being used for water mm. to, I would say, even like a... I think it's called Just Water or one of those, which is, I think, the one which Jaden Smith started, if I remember right. Mm. Which is more a Tetra Pak kind of a thing for water. What this founder was telling me was that India's recycling system is largely centered around plastic. So even if in India you try to bring one of these things in, those yeah. aren't as easily recyclable How as interesting. plastic is. I don't, yeah. this is literally, I don't, I don't know this for a fact, but I thought that was a very interesting insight because 
this is the founder who runs a company which makes stuff which comes in in, in plastic bottles right and i was mm. talking to him saying why can't you move away from that and he said this is the thing this is the most recyclable thing we have in our country but i'm mm. like it's still plastic yeah so do we something to dig, dig into at some point of time i'm going to make a note It'd be a good thing to kind of tap into how the recycling market is going and i know a few marketplaces that i've really been focusing on the eco friendly yeah. stuff so might be a yeah. good thing to talk about but we need to go in for our first break like jealous me has told us to we're going to do one segment of stories and then one segment of asking each other questions but before that we'll take a break and let some advertising do its job Welcome back to Think Fast. Where are you feeling festive today or this week? Have you been festive? I feel like I have no option but to say yes <laughs> to this question. I know I am not festive. I hate no, this time of the year. I, hate this. I am it's the green. It's raining in Delhi. It's disgusting. It's, it's raining here also. About... I'm like, what is this thunderstorm? I was like going to go Seriously? to like IKEA today and it started raining. Wild. Yeah, I have a pimple on my. Cheek, guys. This is like the opposite of feeling freaking festive. But in any case, what do we? What is the story about? <laughs> How festive has been this year? It's the time of the year when, on one end, you see everybody's advertising is exactly the same. Yeah, it's like that one big catalog on your newspaper or everywhere. Purple, else. yellow, and orange seem to be yeah. ruling the roost. Same thing. But uh, how are, how have the sales been? Has it been that big this year? Doesn't seem like. Yup, yup, yup. It has. So before we get into numbers, uh, you know, obviously one source for all the source material that we guys are going to cover over the next couple of minutes is Red Sears report, which mm. they release every year. You know, just to cover all the larger sales. You know, what worked, what didn't work, what were the wins, losses, so on and so forth. So just quickly running through numbers, e-commerce platforms reported nearly 5.4x growth in their overall daily sales. Uh, e-com shipment volumes also grew 3x over business as usual. days uh, during the sale periods i think you know a couple of salient points that stood out for me were tier 2 and tier 3 rallied up in terms of demand drivers for this festive season in fact one of the most interesting things and i'd be interested to get a handle of the data to back this up but as per red sea misho has displaced amazon in overall volumes with 21% share second only after flipkart which again you know sort of like explains this rise and resurgence mm. of you know all tier 2 tier 3 related communications i think two things that stood out for me was obviously this big misho piece and uh, the second one was uh, you know newer regions contributing to sales growth i think an what 68% jump in orders from 2021 supposedly for misho and that's yeah. actually been i mean that's like a huge jump what i'm actually interested to know and i don't know i mean it runs through all the data that we have is that how much of the festive sale growth has also happened on the non ecom side because one of the things we've been seeing over time as things have opened up has been the fact that people are going back to Reading stores a lot more up. yeah as much as they are kind of still buying stuff online hmm. it's no longer just an online let's focus on online and not as not on offline as much kind of a game hmm. right offline's really hmm. kind of back so um, and us also taking into account the fact that um, facebook and google advertising for d2c businesses especially performance marketing has been a pain in recent yeah. times because no one's been yep. able to target right it's been interesting to see how that's kind of panned out because if there is this much growth hmm. and considering how the market environment is it i'm wondering how are the numbers so high i mean i don't think it's an either or uh, so for example hmm. uh, if you for instance look at the categories that have performed fairly well so apart from smartphones people from non metros also shop largely for unbranded fashion and accessories which hmm. aren't like which usually are very uh, retail heavy but that retail usually doesn't get accounted for because who knows what the gmv yeah. of saroji nagar is True. right or like of a sunday market on a street is and obviously this quote unquote category of unbranded fashion and accessories is the kind of category that performs fairly well on say like a flipkart fashion or you know a misho or you know uh, maybe certain sub categories of snap deal and the likes uh, the other category that also seems to have picked up fairly well is beauty and personal care you know yeah. nike interestingly enough never discloses their numbers or talks about growth outside of obviously their quarterly results so it'll be interesting to see mm. how uh, you know their ond reporting uh, shapes up uh, closer to end of december but you know i know there's a lot of like hoopla around uh, this quote unquote bharat shopping but mm. one really interesting data point which i've highlighted uh, as well is uh, with around and i'm quoting from this document ladies and gents but uh, with around 48% of consumers shopping more during festive season than the rest of the year uh, apparently roughly 50 to 55 million shoppers contributed to the gmv and growth in festive season sales now this is interesting because this number is not What like is G- G- gross merchandise value right gmv yeah yeah no. so basically like the number 
number of 50 to 55 million shoppers is not huge. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, like you'd assume yeah. a country where, you know, you have a 400, 500 million odd Indians, you know, using mobile devices so having access to the internet. You know, you'd assume this base would grow over a period of time. Uh, but it seems like your same like top 70 million Indians continue contributing to all things uh, e-commerce, which is where there's a whole debate of Amazon strategy versus Flipkart strategy. But let us not bore our listeners with uh, more, yes. uh, you know, data points. And we'll see what, what Dantarus brings. Dantarus and Diwali, what are they going to bring to these trends? Yes. Dantarus. I never knew it was Dantarus. I thought it was something like Dantarus. Oh my God. Southern problem. Of course. But speaking of money, credit and UPI. Finally. We were this not like speaking one of, like, of money. <laughs> we were speaking of money. Let's, okay, oh, related <laughs> to Dantarus. Uh, sure. <laughs> okay, was, credit and UPI. Gold and money. Same thing. You. Yes, Credit and UPI. Credit has finally launched uh, their UPI-based uh, scan and pay option. Very late in the day, um, I would have expected this to happen much earlier. I do, I mean, rather, I have heard rumors for a while that Credit was trying to launch their own credit card, but I guess at some level, this made more sense. Hmm. UPI is far more embedded now across the country. It's almost like, I can't remember the last time I've taken out my credit card, even though I have one, because I yeah. just find it simpler to just use my UPI app in that sense of the word. So um, it's great. And they're also doing great things to incentivize. Mm. They're giving a lot of like crazy cashbacks cash and discounts yeah. and everything else. You've been experimenting. I haven't used the app for you, but you, I think you used it a little bit. How has your user experience been? My God. So uh, let me start by saying that sadly, I am not a cred user, but uh, Dhruv, you know, as an experiment, once this big UPI announcement happened, Happened. First and foremost, I want to start by saying that they created a lot of like hoopla on Twitter and like the outcome of that hoopla was kind of like, paw, paw, paw. you know what I mean? Like it was a little like, ye sab karke aap, matlab, you know, like UPI integration basically. Kar rahe ho. Like, you know what I mean? Like it was yeah. a little like you made this yeah. sound larger than life, but this is like, you know, basic and easy to uh, and uh, not easy to execute by any barometer, but, uh, but, but fairly like elementary things. So long story short, you know, we guys are playing around uh, with Cred's feature. Uh, and uh, obviously, because Dhruv is cheap, I'm referring to my husband over here, guys. Uh, he uh, uh, transferred, uh, uh, he cred paid me two rupees and got a three rupee cash back, <laughs> uh, which incidentally, by the way, <laughs> which incidentally, by the way, Google and all have stopped doing. So, um, you know, like even when WhatsApp had lo- launched payments and when Google yeah. had launched, when GPay was going all out with their customer acquisition, all these guys went psycho giving cash backs, you know, freebies, this, that and the other. Now, obviously, all these guys are focusing on profitability, getting their, you know, unit economics in place, blah, blah, bullshit, bullshit. Cred seems to have like swooped in and said, you know, hold my beer, guys. Uh, while y'all are like saving cash money, uh, you know, I'm going to bring... Let me give uh, money out. Yes, uh, especially to the 1%, which we thought would not necessarily need more money at, uh, at this point. But um, I'll try this two before... rupees thing. I want to try it for fun. Yeah, give, you I think I'll send Pooja three rupees and she, she will throw three rupees back on my face. <laughs> Yeah, no, but uh, before I get into my, uh, as you can tell, the coffee is hitting. Uh, before I get into my long spiel about, you know, the things that I like about what Cred's done, well, what are your two cents on? Is this too late in the day or was this just one of those Honai Tha? Good, you came Yeah, it was this? one of those Honai Tha pieces. Uh, it also feels like a very Cred thing to do to kind of, mm. you know, really focus on cashbacks or, or like just like discounts, etc. That's been one of their core things they've really pushed for on the app as well. Um, yeah. I've actually... I've bought occasionally from the credit app, but I have a lot of friends who use the credit app and they buy most of the things they do off the credit app itself. So hmm. it makes sense. Feels a little late in the day to do it. I have a feeling it's because of the whole delayed credit card launch and they must have just swapped plans is what I think. Hmm. But um, yeah, I, I don't get why this was this late. Um, that's been the big question in my head. Saying what delayed this so much? Because it wouldn't have been that complex to make a UPI yeah. payment part, uh, a part of cred. So there must have been some reasoning behind it or they just less didn't focus on it. Uh, that's my POV. Yeah, you know, uh, obviously I'm not a fintech uh, expert, which I've said multiple times on multiple different episodes. But like, I, I think the one thing that I really, and, and this is, uh, I, I want cred to be successful for many reasons. But like, I think one of the big reasons why I hope uh, you know, creds like $6.5 billion valuation amounts to something uh, is because unlike a lot of 
startups in India, specifically those that are focused around tech, Cred has really taken an audience first approach to product building, right? Yeah. Uh, on day one, they said we're going to accumulate the users uh, and then we'll sort of, you know, figure out monetization of the users, which is a very like Instagram, Meta, Snapchat, uh, you know, Pinterest, like it's, it's a very media strategy, right? Let me accumulate the users and then figure out monetization, uh, you know, from these cohort of consumers. And the reason I am saying this more specifically in the case of Cred is because they've been very clear about who their consumer is. They haven't necessarily digressed, uh, you know, from who their user is despite, uh, you know, scale requirements, valuation justification requirements, so on and so forth. Uh, so I think the thing that I that I really like about them is I'm sure they've they must have had a lot of pressures to make that six point five billion dollar valuation make sense. They figured out ways around it without necessarily compromising on the person who they're talking to. Mm. Uh, so, like, just to give you a very simple example. Um, I'm not a cred user, but I do keep looking at the app to see, you know, okay, what's new? What are they doing that's interesting? So on and so forth. They've obviously simplified that app a lot. I remember earlier, it used to be super complicated with that weird control, you know, game console rubbish in one corner. So they seem to really simplify that app. But you know what I mean? Like it's still a, it's just the interface makes it a, for the lack of a a, better description, elevated experience. Like it's very, um, it would be wrong for me to compare it to Apple because they're like, poles apart but you know what I mean like it's I just really very, like very well thought through in terms of design and just a clear example of design making it seem so much more premium such a better premium, experience I agree with yeah. 100% on that front and oriented um, around a type of consumer and a type of customer mm. need so um, yeah. I, I think that's going to be my two cents on all things yes. cred and their delayed UPI launch so we have one more story before we go in for break which is the whole meta ads not ads which are meta but ads on the platforms that Meta owns. Wow, I can't believe I came up with that on the fly. But, uh, and how that's going to affect, not just, what's happening here? Meta's rolling out new ad placements and formats, which is anyway bound to happen. They've been a little slower than normal in adding in more kinds of ad formats onto Instagram. Mm. They really want to, I'm sure, because that is the platform for the future for them in in so many ways. um, Because they still haven't figured out how to make WhatsApp really monetizable. So how do you see this whole piece kind of coming out? I know you have strong opinions about this. So I'm just going to let you unleash now. Unleash. Oh my Come on. God. You Go have for it. Uh, taken me out of my cage, guys. No, so, you know, Instagram becoming a cluster f- of ads was first and foremost like bound to happen because it's almost like Facebook doesn't know how to do anything else. You know what I mean? Like advertising is in their blood. But yeah. the problem with Facebook is they do ads so badly. But before we get into, you know, unnecessarily bashing meta, I actually think the biggest loser in all of this are creators on Instagram because Instagram is a platform that, you know, uh, not to sound very like, you know, Mother India about it, but it's very like, you know, take, take, take. I don't know what the platform gives. Um, Mm. Quite unlike YouTube, for example, right? And uh, ladies and gents, if if you heard, I think the episode before the last one, we spoke about YouTube shorts is monetization Mm. where, you know, if you literally just compare YouTube to TikTok, to Snapchat, to Instagram, YouTube gives money back, even if it may seem insignificant, for example, in the case of Indian creators where CPMs are unfortunately just that low because, you know, India is a Dow rich, cash poor country. At least YouTube gives back. I think the problem with Instagram is you see so many creators spending so much energy energy in building so much content for this platform but you get screwed in all directions right you get screwed because your reach goes for a toss you get screwed because the people who followed you out of the goodness of their hearts will never see your content especially Mm. as you become bigger the other weird thing about Instagram uh, and again because TikTok's not here I don't have a point of comparison but basically after you hit a certain number of followers right like 200k 300k followers most of your followers who start following you thereafter are like randos like there is no community building there is no like clarity on who this consumer is Um, you know I've seen like popular Instagrammers go from 1 million to 6.5, 7 million, 10 million followers like in a really short period of time and why it's just because your content's being circulated you know and the thing that you stood so so strongly for um, just doesn't seem to apply anymore the bigger you get. So unlike YouTube, Instagram unfortunately is one of those platforms where the bigger you get the more irrelevant you are and if you take that right and you marry it with a cacophony of ads you're basically telling creators that guess what I really don't give a shit about all the work that you put into your content and all the followers that you've accumulated because I'm Instagram, I'm self-serving and as long as I can showcase ads in the middle of your stories, uh, that's all I really give a shit about. So, um, I don't know, man. I, I... 
can go on and on about you know my mm. rant uh, on how like the biggest losers in all of this are creators but as a creator aap hame tip nahi do so i've actually um, seen an interesting side of instagram because i've i went from like what 30000 followers way back in june when i took a certain call in terms of just overall strategy of simplification and have gone up to 193000 as of today right it's been a interesting That's ride since you post june third third scraps Thirst crabs. I do thirst not post crabs. thirst crabs, guys. My thirst crabs are so occasional, and they're not your thirst crabs. Oh literally, if I want to a pool, it's a photo with me being talked. You little liar, dude! Because of <laughs> you, women in Kanpur are having a good time. <laughs> Basically, that answer. You are sasta, Riddhik Roshan. Of course. Thanks to you, my mother asked me, "Are you okay with being called sasta, Riddhik Roshan?" My mother asked me this question <laughs> two days ago. Uh, but uh, what's been interesting is that. So there are a few things that happened to Instagram, right? Uh, one is I feel across all platforms, you've gone from this follower-based platform to algorithm-driven platform, which means followers after a point of time don't actually matter as much as how much your reach is. So as long as the reach and mm. engagement are the two metrics you focus on, you keep those really high. You kind of work on what's working there and kind of building a content basis that in many cases, it that's what really gives you scale. And, I, and that's not just an Instagram thing; it's a TikTok thing. It started from there. uh it's going to be the reason why you know even like youtube shorts and youtube kind of are pushing in that direction what's been the weird part for instagram is they are rebuilding the app while figuring out what the app is so for instance someone i follow who's a creator out of the us who um basically is this uh more in the wellness space hmm. i just got notification saying now they're accepting subscription based communities hmm. and i clicked on it because i was interested seeing what this is so basically th- this guy basically teaches you how to stretch and okay. i being an old person look at videos where i learn how to stretch and do yoga things and all that stuff because i have like Lies. old person you want to practice name. more thirst traps more thirst traps for trap. sunita in kanpur for <laughs> sunita in kanpur <laughs> yes and what's been interesting with this whole piece is that um you can get exclusive content you get access to one on one chats you get access so it's basically only fans you look at hmm. so the problem instagram has i feel isn't just the ad formats I feel that the ad formats could have come in much earlier, and as Jalas me is kind of popping, saying, "Guys, go for a break." Um, but it's also the fact that you are rebuilding an app while figuring out how to monetize it, yet retain some of its old charm, yet make it TikTok, but also compete with YouTube. That is the problem. Yeah, I don't have an issue with the platform itself because as a creator, I have figured ways that it works really well for me. Some things which are super irritating because they're literally building it on the fly, so it's too many bugs half the time. But most creators in India. post tiktok being banned took one clear strategy and i feel for a lot of them that's really worked they are not mm. a one platform creator anymore mm. everybody is yeah. also on youtube someone's also on linkedin you're also on plus being on instagram no one's sticking to one platform anymore because no one trusts any platform to not change overnight and suddenly take that away from them tiktok yeah. taught people that but yeah. I know we need to go for the break, but I, I remember that you had another point. Is even publishers, right? Now hmm. publishers also going to suffer from this kind of happening because how are they going to be able to hold this together? No, but like you know, the reason why I have such a strong opinion on why creators are getting screwed is because hmm. who did Facebook screw, man? It screwed publishers. Like I remember yeah. when you know LBB started as a side hustle, like back in the day. Um, our biggest platform for growth was Facebook. Uh, you know, and with a lot of like love, care, effort, you accumulate these followers, you accumulate these subscribers, you create all this great content. You know, and obviously you, you use that content to drive clicks back to your you know yeah. website, app, whatever else. Do you remember the furor that happened in between twenty? 2014 to 2017 where yeah. every single publisher under the sun was like livid at facebook for you know first and foremost like you being the reason why content, even though you have followers and dude one is that second like you know creators are the reason why these platforms exist because if there was no content on these platforms no one would come and facebook yeah. especially back in the day the a lot of the content that was being created was this like you know newsy entertainment lifestyley type of content right like i don't know if you mm. remember but everyone from atlantic to new york times to you know like daily mail everyone was pissed about like facebook clamping down on organic reach um and obviously then everyone figured their life outside of facebook and then you know moved on to more proprietary audience building you know switch around their business model the the point that i'm getting to is the reason why i have such a strong opinion on why like facebook's advertising mechanism and now meta's advertising mechanism is so screwed up because i think every single publisher has been at the receiving end of you know getting it's abrupt changes it's abrupt it's not, changes yeah. it's like it's also like 
unfair. You know what I mean? Like either on day one say ki boss. Do you realize that you never say that about YouTube? Because it feels like what whatever YouTube is. is doing is largely it seems in sync with what they always do. Very rarely does that alter too much. There, there are alterations. Do you alterations know why? In- Because YouTube knows that it's a three-sided marketplace. Facebook and Meta and Instagram are in denial of the fact that whether they like it or not, they are a three-sided information marketplace, right? Mm-hmm. One side and one of these sides is the people who are creating content on your platform. And if you don't give them the opportunity to grow, at some point it's going to bite you in the ass the same way it's bitten like Facebook in the ass. So, um, I don't know, man. My two cents to creators, if any of them even listen to Think Fast, which I'm sure, you know, I'm hoping a bunch of them do, uh, is like build a real... really 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 strong brand uh because you know when the dust settles the only thing that survives is like really great brands and you know two examples yeah. one great example rather is new york times uh who you know uh, through the duration of their existence has really focused on being a top notch brand and, and and that's what's helped them survive the you know ups and downs of facebook this and meta that and ig this and you know twitter that and so on and so forth Yeah, I think this part can kind of go on, but I I feel the learning also is the fact that you got to be able to not stick uh, a scenario where you don't rely on any platform for your community yeah. as much as you rely on yourself and find your own way. Even if it's you building Kabutar Express, like can pigeons get you to your community? Sounds like an abit idea, but you never know; it might come true. But uh, try it. Away from Kabutar, <laughs> Kabutar Express. Um, from Salman Khan is the co-founder. Uh, from Maine Pyar Kya. Oh my God. Uh, time for a break. Time for the next section. Time for a break. We'll Let's come back. We'll be asking the questions on "Tum uh, Aaye Kahan Se Ho" is what we're going to ask. But right after this break. Welcome back to Think Fast, where this is now a weirdly AID kind of a scenario where uh, we're going to ask each other questions on our own journeys. Um, the context of the, of why we're doing this is a few things. One is uh, Sujita recently went through um, getting acquired, and I think a lot of people will be interesting to hear about a how LBB started, but how we kind of come to this point and how that's been. Mm-hmm. And I recently just quit advertising. Um, I have, as of uh, a few days ago, officially announced that I've quit advertising. Um, I actually quit advertising. Um, early august but i only officially announced it now and as of the 1st of november onwards um, not in that space anymore so i think truly is dead in my oh my god it's going to be the same joke oh my god yeah. to be fair that was like a, that was an easy joke to tee off uh, uh, yes. but yes so yes uh, i think to kick off um, what is your story how did you land up here land up where today on this not episode not on this podcast how did lbb start and oh my god we're going to start and if you go then, from how when if you if you go from what you set out to me create yeah. rather and what you ended up creating what was that transition what are the things that stayed the same what are the things mm-hmm. that changed so i'm going to speak really fast because uh, i don't want this episode to go on for longer than like an hour but basically lbb started as a side hustle uh, you know i started as a tumblr blog when i was working with the bbc um and the reason why it started as a side hustle was because i'm born and brought up in delhi i ironically i've been wanting to get out of delhi my whole entire life uh, but because the bbc pays well i thought chalo you know i have no reason to leave let me just stay here but figure out ways to make the city more interesting for me uh, and i mm. you know go to different places every weekend and i'd basically take pictures of these places and put up a blog on my tumblr page uh, about this new cool like local discovery that i made and and that tumblr page became a website uh, you know the website grew even more it expanded to an app and you know essentially like obviously lbb has uh, changed significantly as a platform compared to where it started i don't think we've changed in our mission uh, i think our mission uh, you know on the consumer side has always been how do you use dopamine and delight to inspire consumers must to make choices uh, and i know that sounds loose but people say we're a um content platform i disagree i think we do so much more than you know just give people uh, information because you know through lbb you can do everything from attend events to you know win freebies to uh, you know you can play fun games to discover new brands on our app and our web there's so much that we do to uh, you know bring the joy of discovery to consumers you know uh, which and and i think a lot of what what we wanted to recreate is that joy that i had right of walking into a store mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere and just being like holy shit this is so cool i can't believe no one knows that this exists right yeah. i think our journey's been you know we've had our own shares of ups and downs but when 
I reflect on where we are at today, especially in the context of uh, our acquisition, you know, first and foremost, to be to be to build a company and get it to a stage where, you know, a large where we ended up becoming India's and let's be honest, most successful public stock of the past, uh, you know, 365 days. Uh, we, we, we've ended up becoming their first consumer tech acquisition is like not an easy feat, right? Uh, in India, no company does claps for herself, claps for herself. Uh, no, I but like in India, you, MA- silently clap. Thanks, man. Uh, but you know, like in India, MA is not big. Uh, and it's this like, you know, gross, like cockroach mentality that we have, right? Which is like, I will, if I succeed, it means other people need to fail versus like MA is a lot about how do you come together and solve, you know, category problems or consumer problems, you know, much more carefully. Um, and I think the reason why obviously like the Nika partnership to me makes a lot of sense is because both of us have very similar missions, right? Uh, we are very, uh, you know, top 30, 40 million consumers oriented we both solve for categories where desire has to be created. Uh, categories like, you know, makeup, skincare outside of maybe personal care, uh, fashion, home decor, so on and so forth. They're not want, cat- they're not need categories, right? They're want categories. Mm. Uh, and yeah. for want categories, and you've seen this in advertising, right? You need storytelling, you need like vehicles of conversations to drive conversion and purchases, which, you know, we obviously know how to do. So uh, in under four minutes, uh, that's the well that's where we started in here knows where we are well done well done and I, I think it's also interesting that just the journey right because the questions i always end up having with platforms especially is that you know because of how the market changes very easy for you to kind of evolve towards what's required and that's oftentimes takes you in directions where you didn't necessarily want to go but hmm. the, you know the market decided but you kind of stuck to that gun like I, you know, the first time we interacted was when i was I think I was hosting something for you guys. Yeah, in 2020. Uh, and I, but I would yeah. always see, yeah, you know, stuff on the platform there, and I'd go on to it, kind of check for because I like to shop. So uh, mm-hmm. I went to search for a bunch of stuff on the platform earlier as well. That part has not changed. Yeah. For me, like that's the ethos of that, and that's what stays core. And I want to ask you that question: then like, what's kind of changed and what stays the same? What does I want to ask you? I actually want to ask you something very interesting. Is that how did you see? Did you ever see yourself as an entrepreneur? Um, hmm. did, was that something you wanted to do? Was something you always set out to be, or, or was this one of those like, okay, I'm doing this. This blog is going in this direction. It basically means I'm an entrepreneur. Was that how it happened? I think like for me, it was a lot of the latter. Um, and even today, right? I don't like. When I look at myself, I don't really see like a quote unquote entrepreneur or a professional or, you know, whatever. whatever You do not want to be a unicorn? Oh, God, no, definitely not. (laughs) Um, uh, Not that I don't, uh, you know, have the desires to want to build a large company. Um, uh, And hence also a reason for us to want to work with Nike, right? Where, you know, you always want to be a part of something big, right? Whether it's you as someone who's built it or, you know, through uh, modes and, and, and ways of mergers and acquisitions. But I don't know, man, I get a lot lot of joy out of work like I uh, you know it's absurd that we spend Saturday afternoons uh, you know as to let's be honest like strangers right like we have no like shared contact apart from work that we enjoy right so for me like I, I think doing good work has been at the core of what I want to be known for and whether that you know manifests in, in the form of entrepreneurship or it manifests you know in the form of uh, you know being amazing at my job which I was at you know at the BBC or at Biscraft um, or like in anything that I've honestly done in my life uh, for me that is sacrosanct uh, and that's something that I never want to screw around with uh, yeah so my core is just like I, I just get a lot of joy by creating really good things do you know what I mean yeah has that changed post acquisition uh, because there's this is common notion right oh acquisitions done which means founders suddenly there is the, the quote unquote Amiri has entered life or now it's a relaxing because you have now it's like a job or you, you the hunger is gone away. Uh, you hear terms like the thrown around post acquisition. I know I have heard those uh, as well. But have you seen yourself change how you function post or is it pretty much been the same? I think not at all, man. I, I think, you know, um, the things that I really hated about my job um, as like, you know, quote unquote, co-founder, CEO of LBB was this whole like rat race of, you know, running after VCs, amping up mm. your valuation, you know, getting into the cycle of like raising money. And, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it, but uh, yeah. it requires a certain type of like frame of mind that a person needs to be in. And I don't think like, like I think I ran out of interest in that frame of mind, you know, specifically, you know, in the past like three, four years of, of running LBB. Uh, because I, I, like at my core, like I said, right, like I like building things. 
uh, and when I say I like building things, like you know, it's it's kind of like playing with Lego, right? Like it's more fun building Lego than going to a store to buy Lego. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like that. Like, yeah. I, I know it's a really shitty analogy, but that's the closest no, that I'll get to it. So, so for me, uh, you know, this partnership with Nike has actually given me more room to work on things that I like doing. Uh, I've mm. genuinely like thought very deeply about, you know, everything from content community as a conduit to commerce. I've had less like stress in my life about like the things associated with managing large teams, running a business, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not saying the stress has totally gone away, but you know what I mean? Like, like the, the thing that's more unnerving about that stress has gone away and, and and now there's there's joy back in my work man like I'm, I'm yeah. I, I just feel much more like happy and excited and you know like I'm like 200% uh, but enough about me man I want to switch gears to you uh, because this is yeah uh, let's make it about Warren's, me let's make it about me oh my god yes, let's make it about my favorite time man. Uh, no, so I think a couple of things, man, like apart from your midlife crisis, uh, what uh, prompted Those you time. to, <laughs> what prompted you to, you know, step out of advertising? The reason why I ask you this is because, you know, obviously Advertising is Dead is a super popular uh, podcast. Uh, the Glitch is, uh, you know, a very well-established, uh, you know, company. You guys were acquired by WPP. You've, you know what I mean? Like, like you'd assume that this is the point in your life where you'd want to coast uh, because, yeah. you know, you've got this large companies under a large umbrella, you know, you've, you've got popular popularity uh, through the lens of a creator. Why throw yourself off a bridge again? So I'd say till about 2020, I was on that same track. Hmm. Saw myself sticking on for a long term and, and look at my career in that sense of the word. In the last couple of years, I've also like re-evaluated what I want to do in life. And it's, I don't necessarily want to build another company I don't want to go after like global career or get into you know those are all thoughts in my head I would say 2019-2020 kind of sat down and said okay one second is that what I really want to do or if I have the opportunity now what do what if I don't do any of those things just yeah. focus on the few things which I'm genuinely passionate about curious about and just kind of do those so do podcasts create content see how I can give value in that sense of the word not put too much pressure on myself um, and that's mm. one of the prime reasons and also it was something which we worked towards a uh, point of view which Rohit and I had from the start and, and I know Pooja synced up to that very immediately as soon as she came on and, and she came on pretty early in our journey like she came out in what year three if I remember right and um we never wanted to be a founder slash executive leadership driven business. We hmm. wanted to have a widespread leadership uh, core. Um, and, and I remember this, we would do these yearly leadership catch-ups and there used to be about six, eight people there. And then one year we decided to just scale it up and we went from eight people to 25 people in leadership, spread things out, put people on things. And now a lot of those people have really, we, we've worked on making sure they got elevated within the system. They had really prominent roles, not just at Glitch, but across the network as well. So they're yeah. all doing really well. We all evaluated what you want to do in life. Roads setting off and starting another startup and he's gone going going back into the grind. I am now looking at life in a very different way. I also feel like I've done, I feel every journey has its point. And for me, it was like, okay, yeah. I've done what I had to do here. Is this necessarily what is super exciting to me right now? Uh, is something which I really want to do right now? It wasn't. Mm. Hmm. And it's a good time to step away when you're at that point, when you know the system can move uh, without you. Yeah. Um, and yeah. everything's in place. We spent a year putting this together to make sure mm. we transitioned at this point of time. And um, so it, it, the the, pull, the exit was was smooth. Nothing from a functional standpoint is affected, which is which was the idea. Um, and also feel that um, I'm going back to my roots. I started off as a content uh, production person, which is what I started off as uh, back in MTV and Channel V. Glitch was never yeah. intended to be an agency. We, we were a production company, uh, which became an agency. Right? So I'm, I'm going back to production, but this time more. I don't think I want to start a company. I don't necessarily even want to have a team, which is more than like, I don't want double digit uh, employees uh, on my creative mm. front as well. Um, I'm sticking to those rules for some time. I also want to live in shorts and uh, and, and wear <laughs> linens. Uh, and uh, living the creator life is interesting. Um, just starting work on my second book as well. So lots happening. Wow, look at you. Um, on like a personal note, right? Uh, and I don't, I wish more founders spoke about this, but how has your relationship with money changed over the past, you know, couple of years? Because uh, obviously advertising um, and even production for that matter is not, you need to like really put in blood, sweat, tears for you to start seeing cash money come in through the door, mm -hmm. right? And first couple yeah. of years of entrepreneurship are always fairly tough uh, and yeah. you know of course you guys had a great exit I'm sure you made bank over the past couple of uh, uh, you know years so how has your relationship with money changed over you know as you reflect on your journey 
So I had this really funny thing that happened to me. Um, I went on someone's pod. I, I forget if it's a podcast or some. It was some YouTube video, and the guy said, mm. and this guy was he has this format where he asks questions in an, in an interrogation format. He said, "What is the most expensive thing that you have bought that you regret?" And in this tone, I said, "A pair yeah. of sneakers." Um, and he said, "How expensive were those?" I said, fifteen thousand rupees." He's like, "What?" And I'm like, "No, that is seriously the biggest expense I have made that I regret because I because I don't on I don't think me spending money has become like I suddenly haven't gone and started buying like really expensive things. I, the mm. most expensive thing I would have bought in life was to buy a house, but that was more an emotional decision than a let's splurge decision. Um, yeah. But how has it changed? I feel that through the glitch journey, uh, we never knew acquisitions were even a thing. We never knew that we just had want to make sure we hit salary. We were growing in that sense till we start getting approached. I would say halfway through. Uh, I think what by about year six, year seven is when we start getting approached, uh, if I remember right. But maybe even year five, mm, and we start working towards how that could help us beyond just individual money, but for the company. So I've mm. always had a different way to look at money from a business standpoint and from a personal standpoint. Personal, I've always been like, you know, that's no nonsense investing if at all if i invested so i like, do an sip here and there not really over splurge money i'm reasonably cheap as a person in terms of just spending uh, i'm not one of those who go out and like splurge money for random reasons but on the business front i was always like let's focus on what can help growth uh, but that's hmm. changed for us post acquisition from a business standpoint because you suddenly had someone behind you who had a financial system in place um, yeah. and I, and we plug into that it just makes the business more secure your systems your processes that's one of the core things we wanted we wanted like stuff like financial practices legal all of that to really compliance to be a strong part of our business which we were doing in our way but we didn't have the experience to kind of do that right yeah and advertising can get complicated on that front so that's one thing but on a personal front to be honest the first time you make that big check of money i did what Anybody should do is I take a screenshot of my uh, bank statement of that one. <laughs> Shit, coming. I should have done that. I took a screenshot I and I was like, that. just kept that aside and then put yeah. that money into like an investment for the long term and still lived exactly the way I lived before, except for a few things here and there that hmm. so we, we ended up have, buying a house and you know, obviously securing a bunch of things for for family, etc. But um, no major random splurges, except for the fact that I do try. I do. A little more often upgrade my phone than I used to, which is basically I went from like every two Bad years habit. to almost Bad every year kind habit. of a scenario. Yeah, that's the only yeah. thing. But um, I don't think that's changed too much. And people keep asking me about uh, money advice, and I'm like, just find someone smart, at least two sets of uh, professionals who are strong investment people, and just invest with them. Uh, don't fall for every second uh, offer that comes. Yes, and don't get tempted by Instagram ads. Uh, last question for you, man. Uh, I think the one reason why. I like genuinely thoroughly enjoy doing this uh, you know with you is I just feel like you're a really good role model for a lot of your listeners you know there's all types of like masculinity that exists right and and as you know a female uh, specifically in tech uh, I can tell you that there are you know multiple rungs of uh. ma- masculinity that get flung in your face uh, you know um, uh, from time to time but I I think the reason why like I think there needs to be more role models like you for especially young indian men is because you know you you've got this like really strong sense of you're very like secure with who you are uh, you're also very secure about you know having badass wife or who is no, the man. ceo of a Super company star. that you know um a uh, junior co-founder started and who's grown from strength to strength uh, you know at the glitch and now at uh, you know wpp's uh, 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 other arm i always keep up the acronym VMY VML YNR VML YNR it's a long one it's a, it's a it's complicated yeah and i think and i think even with our conversations right like it's never been a main aapse bada hu main aapko sikhata you know what i mean like like yeah. you're just a really like secure confident about where you're at in your life um so so two quick questions for you were you have you always been like this uh, and the second is you know for especially for like young listeners who are tuning in who are you know 18 to 24 have all of these very like complex weird uh, you know role models cropping up uh, what do you think the idea of masculinity really is I don't think it's about gender. Bro. Oh, heavy question, heavy question. <laughs> this is the nicest thing you have ever said to me by the way. One in one year. <laughs> Enjoy it while it lasts, <laughs> never coming back to this show ever again. So, here's the thing. Um 
I don't think it's a gender thing for me as much as I always just try. I genuinely feel the need to be nice to a fault sometimes because I just do too much to be a people pleaser. It's been a problem uh, when I go people pleasing in that sense of the word. But I just found that being decent is one of the best things you can do. Not just by because you have to be, but I think it's, a, it's a, it makes you feel much nicer. And it kind of showed for me. I think the last three four days for me post me announcing have been supremely humbling, right? Because everything from messages to comments on po- social posts etc. have been stories which I don't remember but mm. people do like someone who said when she was an intern that and she'd come down from Bangalore and uh, it was rain, her first Bombay rains and she was feeling homesick and I sent her rava upma saying mm. you're missing Bangalore so this is like home food habit and I don't remember it I have no recollection of sending that to her and she remembers it till date and I was like what easy like 5-6 years ago or mm. someone else who remembered that my interview with her was about 15 minutes and I said no we're hiring you and she's literally mm. right now like one of the biggest strongest leaders we have and small things like small people like small incidents of things that have happened someone who's kind of ass got saved and I didn't even though they lost money for the company but I kind of like so I'm not covering for you we'll discuss what went wrong but I'm not jumping on you as the reaction my reaction is how do we move forward from this so it's always been my process to be that way I'm very like let's look forward and see what happens next try to be decent has been my thing um i don't believe in throwing ego at people i've i've always been averse to that i i'm the opposite i will undermine uh, underplay myself more than that is what i've been told but i've never been this open about how i function mm, i feel the last two odd years two three years of just creating content being a lot more uh, out there on social has been a great for me for me to feel comfortable with talking about this is how i am and i'm very okay being that like i enjoy being a dad i um i literally i was playing with glitter glue um a little while ago and it's super fun i'm like glad to talk about playing with glitter glue man it's it's hmm. uh, it, it's uh, entertaining i get my fingernails painted half the time by my daughter and i even, i think it's fun uh, <laughs> as long as i can take it off um at some level but you don't have to worry about talking about those things i feel it naturally happened to me it wasn't it's never been a I have to be this way. I have however and my worry with the word role model often times is have I done stupid shitty things that guys do uh, when you're growing up? Yes, I have. Hmm. Do you know you we've all said the wrong jokes, we've all uh, said things which in hindsight which or acted in, in just like this way guys end up talking because you think that's the way guys need to talk but at yeah. some point you have to there is a point at which that goes from being juvenile to being just an a dick. and i thankfully i feel i made the right friends and i surround myself with the right people at that transition point because there was a point of time in life when i was veering towards becoming a bit of a dick um mm. and uh, thankfully that did not happen um because i saw that as the way guys have to be um, yeah. and you sometimes don't know any better but um, i also credit friends and i also have a you need to find the right partner who tells you off when you are going the wrong route um and pooja yeah. is that for me like she'll call me out on If I'm making something about myself, if I'm making something about me being self-deprecating or having too much ego or just generally trying to be a bit of like veering towards douche, um, mm. she will call me or say, this is what you're doing. Um, and not in like a don't do it. Like this is what you're doing. You should realize that Recognize fact. Recognize it. Um, yeah. And you need to have that person or people like that in your life. And I thankfully have many mm. of those. Um, yeah. So that's why I, I function like this. But uh, I'm happy to hear it shows uh, that I try to be decent. Yes, queen. And with that, our heart to heart is over, ladies and gents. Yeah, kya segment tha? Day segment. Oh, my God, was... aasu a gaye. I think it's a good thing we did it after a year. It wouldn't have been as yeah. as nice if we did it at the start of the show. Uh, a I year know. ago. And, I and we, 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 uh, fine, jealous me. I know. I know it's more than an hour. It's okay. Thoda jealous me. Just like episode, I don't tha. give a shit about your heart to heart. I am. It's a Saturday. A I want to go party right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. So, okay, she's saying carry on. But anyway, guys, we'll go for a break now. We'll be back with the last segment of Think Fast and Advertising Instead. Yes, both shows in one. Yeah, package. Welcome back to Think Fast, where. And advertising is dead. Where I think what we'll do is, um, you've been on advertising is dead a while back, though. I think it's been a bit yes. of a, uh, actually quite a while. I, I, yeah, I remember like right, you years, were in the late. 80s episodes of advertising is dead now that shows in its late 180 so over 100 episodes ago in that yeah. sense if i remember right um and i don't know if you remember the questions which i normally ask all my guests in the last segment so we'll do that um and um and what do you spend a lot of time doing bro don't forget yes and recommendations. Forget recommendations. Do. recommendations are part of what i ask in advertising is dead also so the good part Ooh. is it all syncs together um, what do you spend a lot of time doing um, outside of podcasting and um, an lbb that keeps you uh, excited and going what's your um 
thing to kind of jump into release um i genuinely really enjoy like architecture and interiors and i feel like my like taste and my eye has become exponentially better than it was when i just stumbled into like enjoying you know all things design uh, and for me uh, i don't know man like you know i i thoroughly enjoy being creative and uh, and uh, it's very tempting to be glued to your phone you know what i mean and like browsing pinterest and instagram 24/7 or or just being hit with news and information 24/7 but but for me i make sense of the chaos uh, through uh, you know um, my like tryst with architecture interiors design and the like so uh, th- that's my like one big release and also my one big indulgence actually i have never answered this question myself and while well, astra sir might be interested to answer it is what have i um so i weirdly enough like to study stuff around mindfulness um psychology um and also pick up really random things like there is one thing which at some point of time on this show i shall use is i have is just bought myself object. a ukulele um, oh my which i'm going to start learning true midlife crisis oh, is happening no. i got a ukulele guys somebody <laughs> so, say varun call pooja sos <laughs> but yeah, I, i like to i like to experiment learning newer things um and um, and for some reason this whole like the mindfulness mental fitness side of things has been super interesting for me i've actually signed up for two courses which i in the process of trying to finish before march because the deadline for both is that time is one is a course on happiness sort of harvard and one which is a course on the science of well being uh, which is from yale um so mm. hopefully by march i'll finish both um oh my but, god i yeah, don't add a lot of these courses bio. actually <laughs> Imagine that I will have that on my bio as well. LinkedIn may add to guys. The best is people um, who like will do like a one day course on Coursera from Harvard and will say graduated yes. with a degree from Harvard University and was like please. So I just explain my happiness course is off of no, 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 one of the courses is actually off of Coursera but it's certified because you have to submit uh, assignments and you pay for it separately. So I'm just like okay, okay whatever helps you sleep people. at night. One of those whatever things is off Coursera. Whatever helps you legitimize your addition to your LinkedIn bio. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. moving to recommendations thing. what do you yes, recommend uh, what do you recommend man? this week uh, except for your uh, apart from your song okay guys if you want a banger to help you survive the rest of this week and also to help you enjoy um uh, all things festive season you have to hear this song to let me let's add it to our show notes uh, it is a mashup of brown munde and peaches by justin bieber and it is fan fantastic does it then uh, become yeah. peach munde yeah no it's called peach munde bro Oh. It's called Peach Monday. Yeah, it's so good. It's well so done. so well so good. Uh yeah, so that will be my uh you know funsies recommendation for the week. What about you? I, I don't know if I recommend this book before. It's called Joyful. Have I recommended this before? Um I feel you will enjoy this. Uh because you're too um, woke, yeah. I can't. Like I just No, can't. no, it's uh, you no know, it, it uses it uses psychology all that stuff, but it basically also adds to color science. So how you do up mm-hmm. your interiors how can they make you uh, how can certain things make you feel more joyful in your surroundings by the things yeah. and the colors you put in your surroundings so considering oh, your architecture interior so this one is very interesting for that hence i wow. picked this as a array i have uh, i just started to like rummage through it and i didn't realize that that was the biggest part of the book till i bought it and yeah. it's super interesting just like color science and like how like things like plants help how certain colors help in certain areas of the house and So yeah. it's super interesting to dig into. Uh, How what fun. else? Ah, uh, what can you put together in an instant? Nothing. Peanut butter and toast. What about uh, you? What can you put together in an instant? Uh, I can put together a bad joke in an instant. Oh yes, of course. I will attest to that. Yes, the worse the joke you need, ladies and gents, please call uh, Mr. Dugirala for help. Yes. And uh, with that ends this crossover. I will not ask the final question, which is generally a play on the name of advertising is dead, because this, as of this week, for me, career-wise, advertising is actually dead. So oh, shit. Uh, let's see how that progresses. Oh my God. But uh, it's gonna be great. We wish you all the best. Next week onwards, back to regular programming on both the shows. Yes. And uh, till then, um, toodles and uh, see you later. Bye, guys. Bye.